Good morning, folk. I trust that uh, it's been a good Easter morning for you, and I trust that today, particularly, you are celebrating the fact of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is risen, and He is the hope for our faith. My family and I are keeping well, um, and I hope that you are all also well and managing your isolation. And I hope you are well stocked up with food and of all the commodities, toilet paper. I'm going to read this morning from Luke chapter 24, and I want to read the first 12 verses. So if you have your Bibles open, and I would encourage you to keep them open in whatever format you have them, turn to Luke chapter 24, and we're going to read the first 12 verses of Luke 24. Verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleaned like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary, Magdalene, Joanna, Mary of the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the woman because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. This is God's word. Let's pray this morning together before we turn our attention to see what God has to say to us. Our Father, we thank you for the wonder of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an amazing event. Death could not hold you in that grave. No matter what people had done to you, no matter the fact that you had been embalmed, yet you rose on the third day, on Sunday, and you are alive and you have been exalted to heaven, seated at the right hand of your Father. What a wonderful celebratory day we have to remember this morning as we celebrate your resurrection. We ask that as we look at your word, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you would enable us to understand your word. May the Lord Jesus Christ be prominent. May he be exalted. May he be lifted up. May we come to see him more clearly. May we fall more in love with him this morning. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would speak to those who don't know you, any who do not have a relationship with you, have yet to bow their knee before you. Oh God, have mercy on them. Draw them to yourself. Make Christ real to them this morning. Speak to their hearts and to their minds. Open their ears, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Lawyer Sir Edward Clark said, As a lawyer, I've made a prolonged study of the evidences for the events of the first Easter day. For me, the evidence is conclusive. And over and over again, in the high court, I have secured the verdict on evidence not nearly so compelling. Inference follows on evidence, and truthful witness is always artless and disdains effect. 
The gospel evidence for the resurrection is of this class. And as a lawyer, I accept it unreservedly as the testimony of truthful men to facts they were able to substantiate. The historian Thomas Arnold of Oxford has written, The evidence for our Lord's life and death and resurrection may be and often has been shown to be satisfactory. It is good according to the common rules for distinguishing good evidence from bad. Thousands and tens of thousands of persons have gone through it piece by piece, as carefully as every judge summing a tip on an important case. I myself have done it many times over, not to persuade others, but to satisfy myself. I've been used for many years to study the history of other times and to examine and weigh the evidence of those who have written about them. And I know of no one fact in history of mankind which is better proved by fuller evidence than the great sign that God has given that Christ died and rose again from the dead. Christianity stands or falls on the resurrection of Christ. Christians know this. I think even unbelievers know this reality. If somehow it could be proved that Christ did not rise from the dead, then Christianity would collapse into a heap. And we would be worshipping this morning in vain. You will remember the book that uh, is written, The Case for Christ, by Lee Strobel, turned into a movie, who as an atheist set out as a journalist to investigate whether or not the resurrection of Jesus Christ could in fact be substantiated. And after his investigation, searching all possible leads, he came to the only conclusion possible that historically Jesus Christ had been raised from the dead. And in turn, as a result of this evidence and wrestling with this evidence, eventually he turned himself towards Christ and was converted and became a Christian based upon evidence. These women arrive at the tomb and they discover the tomb is empty. Because Jesus is back from the dead. The only man ever to have been raised from the dead, never to die again. There have, of course, in the Bible been other resurrections. But none of those resurrections uh, were raised never to die again. All of them had to face death again. But Jesus rose from the dead and then 40 days later, ascended into heaven and is now exalted at the right hand of God the Father. He remains alive and thus it is on the basis of his resurrection that Christians know one day that when death comes knocking at their door that they too, like Christ, will be raised from the dead. Our hope is is based in the concrete evidence that Jesus Christ came back from the dead, is raised to life, and guarantees the resurrection of all who trust in him. I want you to notice in this passage what we can learn from it. Firstly, the significance of the empty tomb. The significance of of the empty tomb. Look at verses 1 to 3. Let me reread them for you. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They had found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Now, Luke phrases a very carefully Uh, the way he brings out these words. When he says they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, he is not saying that uh, there is a corpse somewhere hidden in the tomb that can be found. No, what Luke is saying is that there is no corpse to be found 
because no corpse exists. In other words, there is no dead body anywhere to be found. And the reason there is no dead body to be found is precisely because Christ has been raised from the dead. Now these women that go to the tomb, they go there because they want to anoint Jesus' body with spices. Whether or not they had enough time to complete the process before the Sabbath came into effect, we're not told. What we are told is that they go to this tomb at the crack of dawn. It indicates something of the devotion of these women to Jesus, even though at this point they think Jesus remains embalmed in that tomb, still dead. And when they arrive, they're surprised to find the stone has been rolled away. Now, to seal the tomb of the Lord Jesus Christ, there would have been a large stone, either a big round one that was rolled in front of the tomb that sealed the tomb, or a stone that had plugged the cavity of the tomb. We're not told what kind of stone there is. All we are told is the tomb is sealed, precisely so that the body cannot be stolen. The other Gospels tell us that the Romans had posted two guards at the tomb to ensure that no one could come into that tomb and steal the body. So there is double protection there. There's the protection of the stone that prevents people from stealing the body. Then there's the protection of the guards who are ensuring that no one can come into the tomb. Now you must understand, if those guards failed in their duty to protect the tomb, the result would have been that they would have been executed. So they have a good reason to protect the tomb. If they fail, they lose their lives. When the women arrive, the stone is gone. Matthew in chapter 28 verse 2 tells us what happened. Let me read those verses to you. Matthew writes and he says, After the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. So Matthew gives us a little bit uh, of extra information that Luke doesn't include because it doesn't fit within Luke's purposes. And he tells us that an angel comes and removes the stone, thus enabling these women to go into the tomb. And they discover there is no body. There can be no body because Jesus has been raised from the dead. Now there was a rumor that was circulated at the time that the disciples came in and stole the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if that was true, the disciples would have had to have rolled the stone away. The disciples would have had to overpower the guards. And then, having taken this dead body out, they would have had to have disposed of it somewhere to have covered up their stealing of the body. And then, over on top of all of that, they continue to proclaim the resurrection of Christ and eventually, all by one, according to church history, are martyred. Now, if Jesus is not raised from the dead, if they know absolutely that Jesus remains dead, why would they give their lives for a dead man? Why would they be willing to be martyred for a dead man. It's highly unlikely that that would have been the case. If others had stolen the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, then surely when the apostles claimed that he had been raised from the dead, those who had stolen the body would have produced a dead body and said, look here, here's the body. Here's proof Jesus is not raised from the dead. So what we have with an empty tomb is we have at least proof that Christ was raised from the dead. Now, I know it's not the only proof that Christ is raised from the dead. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul goes through some other proofs. He goes through witnesses who have seen the resurrected Christ. And so it's not only the fact of the empty tomb, but the empty tomb does at least provide some concrete evidence that Jesus Christ 
is not there. His body is gone. And the reason we are told in this gospel that Jesus is not to be found there is because he has been raised from the dead. It is positive proof. There's a wonderful story that I want to relate to, if I can just get my notes, uh, that speak about uh, the truth of how the empty tomb provides encouragement and hope to those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about a little boy whose name is Philip, who was suffering with Down syndrome. This little boy, Philip, attended a third grade Sunday school class with several eight-year-old boys and girls. Typical of that age, the children did not readily accept Philip because of his differences, according to an article in the Leadership magazine. But because of the creative teacher, they began to care about Philip and accept him as part of the group, though they hadn't yet fully accepted Philip. The Sunday after Easter, the teacher brought some uh, owl egg pantyhose containers, the kind that looked like large eggs. Each children received one and were told to go outside on that lovely spring day and to find some symbol for new life and to put it in the egg-like container. Back in the classroom, they would share their new life symbols, opening the containers one by one in surprise fashion. Back in the classroom, uh, when they had finished running around the church property, and they'd returned to put their containers on the table, one by one, they began to open their containers. Surrounded by the children, the teacher began to ask them as she opened the containers what were in them. After each one, whether a flower, a butterfly, or a leaf, the class would ooh and ah. Then one was opened, revealing nothing inside. The children exclaimed, that's stupid, that's not fair, somebody didn't do their assignment. Philip spoke up. That's mine, he said. Philip, don't you ever do things right, a student retorted. There's nothing there. I did so do it, Philip insisted. I did do it. It's empty because the tomb was empty. Silence followed. From then on, Philip became a full member of the class. He died not long afterward from an infection most normal children would have shrugged off. At the funeral, this class of eight-year-olds marched up to the altar, not with flowers, but with their Sunday school teacher, each to lay on it an empty pantyhose egg. It is that hope of knowing The empty tomb signifies that Jesus Christ is not in that tomb. He has been raised from the dead. He is alive. And it's his life, it's his living that brings hope, concrete hope to the believer. And offers hope to the world that finds itself living right now in such difficult times. Jesus, who has been raised to to life, reaches out to this lost and hopeless world. And he says, I have come that you might participate, that you might also have resurrection life. So that if the coronavirus happens to take you, if it happens to affect you so that you end up perishing in this world, take heart. I have been raised from the dead so that you too can enjoy resurrection life. Secondly, I want you to notice the significance of fulfilled prophecy. The significance of fulfilled prophecy. This is so very important. Look at verses uh, 4 to 9. Let me read them for you. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, 
Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember, now listen carefully, remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men to be crucified and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Now Luke is very deliberate the way he frames that. He reminds them that Jesus beforehand has already said to them that this is going to happen. But look how he does it. He reminds them that Jesus is first, before he is raised from the dead, going to be handed over to sinful men. And it is those sinful men who are going to put Jesus on the cross. Ultimately, it is Pilate, the governor, who makes and pronounces the sentence upon Jesus. He says Jesus is going to be condemned to death because the Jews did not have the power to put anyone to death, even though they were the ones who had brought Jesus to Pilate. And they had accused Jesus, and they had said Jesus was guilty of blasphemy. And the accusation, even though it was false, ultimately is what causes Pilate to say, well, I'm going to pronounce sentence. And Pilate, in fact, even gives them the option of saying, well, we've got a, another murder here. Uh, Barabbas, maybe we, we, we can release Barabbas in place of Jesus. Who do you want? Do you want me to condemn Bar uh, Barabbas, who is a murderer, or do you want me to condemn Jesus, whom you have given to me on these charges? And eventually the crowd shout, we want you to crucify Jesus, release Barabbas, even though he's a, a murderer. Such is their anger and such is the intensity of wanting to put Jesus on the cross. So Luke reminds us that Jesus prophesied that ultimately he is going to be strung up on a cross because of sinful men. Now that's very, very important. Because Jesus, if he is going to fulfill the plan and purpose of God, must die on the cross for sinful people. And while you and I stand at a distance from Jesus, because we are so far down the line from the event of the crucifixion, we must not think that somehow that alleviates us or that declares us to be innocent of his death, his crucifixion on the cross. Why is that so? Well, because like those men who put him up on that cross, like that crowd who bade for his blood, we like them are also sinful. And the reason that Jesus comes into this world is to pay for our sin, is to die for sinners. And you and I are born as sinners. We inherit the sinful nature from our parents who inherited it from their parents, who inherited it from their parents, all the way back to the first two people, Adam and Eve. So all of us are born as sinners. We are born cut off from God. We are born as God's enemies, as Paul tells us in Romans. We are born spiritually dead. We have no life in us, and there is nothing we can do to change our status. No amount of good works, no amount of effort, no amount of trying to live up to a certain ethical standard is ever going to make us right before God. Because if we are ever going to be right before God, the standard that God requires is perfection. And none of us can ever reach that standard of perfection because we are born with a sinful nature. And that sinful nature drives us to sin. It drives us to rebel against God so that we choose of our own free will to reject Christ, to rebel against God. And we bring as a result of that 
God's judgment down upon us. We are responsible. We are accountable to God. He has created us. And we cannot simply think that somehow God is going to turn a blind eye and God is not going to deal with our rebellion against him. God must deal with our rebellion against him because he is a just God. He is a just judge. And he must pass judgment on our rebellion. He cannot simply pretend that it's okay for us to continue to rebel against him without there being any consequences to our rebellion. If he were to do that, he would fail to be a just judge. So what does God do? He sends his only son, He sends the Lord Jesus Christ into this world. And Jesus comes into this world to be born as one of us, to live amongst us, to be able to experience all that we experience. And one who fulfills the law of God, one who is not born as a sinner, but is conceived of the Holy Spirit, is born as the second Adam, the second sinless man and who lives his life in perfect accordance with God, and thus meets the standard that God requires. And as a result of that, he is able to go to that cross, for when he is strung up on that cross, even though he is put on that cross by sinful people, even though it's our sin that ultimately nails him to the cross, He does so as part of God's predetermined plan so that he may pay the price, that he may pay the penalty for our sin, for our rebellion. He takes upon himself our sin. And were it not for our sin, he would not be strung up on a cross. But it's because of our sin that the only way that he can satisfy the justice of God is to die in our place as a substitute, as one who bears our shame, as one who bears our rebellion, as one who dies on our behalf, so that you and I don't have to suffer The penalty of our sin. What is the penalty of our sin? Well, Paul tells us, for the wages of sin is death, he says. Not physical death, but spiritual death. Being cut off from God. Experiencing the wrath of God. Thus on the cross, Jesus Christ experiences the wrath of God. This innocent man, this innocent God-man experiences God pouring out his judgment upon him. God cutting him off from his presence, which is why Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that you and I, as the ones who deserve to die for our sin, who deserve to be condemned for our sin, who deserve to pay the penalty for our sin, can be set free. When we come to him in repentance, when we come to him turning away from our sin, acknowledging our rebellion against God, confessing that rebellion against God, and we come with humble hearts recognizing that we deserve God's wrath, We come and we bow before the Savior. And with repentant hearts as we turn away from sin, God gives us life. God gives us eternal life. God lifts the burden of our sin. God forgives us. And Jesus Christ stands as our justifier. The one who says, I have borne their sin. I have paid their price. And God's approval of Jesus Christ, which Luke also then mentions, is the very fact of his resurrection. The angels proclaim, don't you remember 
Not only would he be condemned by sinful men, not only would he die so cruel a death, but he would also be raised to life. Because God accepted his payment on our behalf. And God, as a result of accepting his sacrifice, his payment for our rebellion, raises him from the dead. Death could not hold him in that grave. And when he is raised from the dead, he breaks the power of death. He breaks the power of sin. He releases the captives from captivity to Satan. And he conquers death, bringing victory to all who confess him as Lord. And thus, he gives eternal life resurrection life, life that means when we die in this world, one day we will be raised back to life and we will live with God forever. All of this because Jesus Christ has paid our price, has been raised from the dead. And in 1 Corinthians 15, he says he is the first fruit of those who will follow. In other words, his resurrection is the guarantee of our resurrection. Therefore, there is no Christian in this world that ever needs to fear death. Oh no, my dear friends. If you know Jesus, if you've come to faith in Christ, then you possess now his resurrected life. And that resurrected life ensures that when your physical body comes to the end and when your eyes close in death in this world, you will be raised to life in the world to come and you will go to live in a new heaven and a new earth created for you by Jesus in a perfect world where you will enjoy this new life when you receive a new resurrection body that is no longer subject to decay, no longer subject to pain, no longer subject to disease, no longer subject to wasting away, a perfect resurrected body one that has form, one that has bones, one that has flesh, because when Jesus is raised from the dead and he appears to his disciples, he eats with them on the beach. He says to them, touch me, feel. You can feel that Jesus isn't some ghost, some apparition. And in the same way that he is raised from the dead with the same body that he comes back from the dead with, all believers will receive that body. That is the hope, my dear friends, of resurrection. You don't need to fear getting coronavirus and perhaps dying from coronavirus because if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've repented of your sin, if you've turned away from it, and if you've trusted in Christ, you will at that moment go to be with him forever. That is the wonderful hope we have in Jesus it is the hope that Jesus offers to all without exception. His death is sufficient for all. And thus, these uh, women are able to be reminded of this prophecy that has now been fulfilled of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has been true to his word. He is alive. And soon he will appear not only to these women, but to all his disciples and then to another 500 people. And he will appear on numerous occasions, validating the fact that he is alive. This is the hope that we have as believers. This is not all there is in this world. We don't cast our eyes on life only as it is, is it, as it is experienced in this world, but we cast our eyes beyond this world to the world to come, where because Jesus is now alive, one day 
we too will be alive and with God in his presence forever. And thus, there is a convinced witness that goes back to the disciples. That's why the women run back and they say to the 11 who are waiting uh, uh, and sitting in that room, they say to him, we want to tell you something. Jesus Christ is alive. He's not dead. That tomb's empty. An angel appeared to us. He reminded us of the prophecy. The prophecy has occurred. It's happened. He's alive. He's living. Come and see for yourself. And Peter gets up and he runs to that tomb. And he walks into that tomb. And he looks into that tomb. And he sees what the woman saw, an empty tomb. But sadly, my dear friends, sadly, I want you to notice that there is a stumbling block here to belief. And that stumbling block we see is the response of these 11 men as they hear this incredible news that these women must bring. They have to tell them it's so exciting, it's so compelling, they can't hold back, they have to, they have to speak out and say, come in and, and see what's happened. These men who are in that room look at these women and they say to them, don't talk rubbish. Is that my, not, my dear friends, sometimes the response of the world? You Christians talk about a resurrection. You Christians talk about someone coming right from the dead. What rubbish. So sadly, we can also respond like that. A response of disbelief, a response of doubt, a response of rejecting the good news. Don't be like those 11. Don't walk down that same path. And even when Peter runs to that tomb, and even when he enters into the tomb, and even when he sees for himself that what these women have said to him about the tomb being empty, and therefore if they have been encountered an angel, two angels who have told them that Jesus is raised from the dead, even at that point Peter still has some doubts. Oh my dear friends, don't allow the doubts that you might have to cause you not to believe. Don't allow your doubts to cause you to end up missing out on the salvation that the Lord Jesus Christ offers. Sometimes we want more. We want to say, give me proof, show me, give me evidence. Was that not the problem of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16 verses 19 to 30? Where this rich man who had everything there was to have in this world, luxury, food, wealth, possession, and the poor man Lazarus who ate at his table had nothing and satisfied himself with just the crumbs that fell from the tabletop and would eat those crumbs on the floor. And when that rich man died, he went to hell. And when Lazarus died, he went to heaven. And then as Jesus recounts this parable, there's this man, this rich man in hell in agony with the pain that he's experiencing. And he cries out to Lazarus and he says to Lazarus, please, please, let me go back. Let me warn my brothers. Let me warn my family. Let me come out. If they see a dead man rise, then they will believe. And Lazarus turns to him and says, they have the law and the prophets. In other words, they have the scriptures. They don't need you to come from, back from the dead. God has given them everything they need in order to believe. If only they would turn to those scriptures. If only they would open those scriptures. If only they would read those scriptures. If only they would read it with an open mind and allow the word of God to penetrate into their soul. That's enough. And not even a dead man being raised from the dead in the form of this rich man would convince anyone, says Jesus. Sometimes the unbeliever wants more and more and more proof. But so often that is not so much wanting proof as it is an excuse for their continued rejection of the offer of grace. I'll never forget when Janice and I were a little bit younger, and we had just been married. We went for a holiday down 
uh, to the Drakensberg Mountains in South Africa. It's a range of mountains, and we would go there frequently uh, for holidays, sometimes weekends, sometimes for longer. And while we were camped at this particular campsite at the bottom of this mountain range, we met a couple uh, who were in a caravan next to us. And when it was happened to start raining, they invited us to come and sit with them in the caravan. And then we got to know them a little better and we got chatting. And after uh, that uh, afternoon, they said, why don't you come back? We're going to have a roast chicken tonight for dinner. Why don't you come and join us for dinner? And so we did. And as is usually the case when you're a pastor and you get asked about what you do, one thing leads to another. And we began to get onto a discussion about Jesus. And we began to talk about what he had done and how he had come into the world and how he had died to save sinners and how God had raised him from the dead. And I'll never forget as this man looked at me and he turned at me and he said to me, Ian, it's not enough. I need more. It just doesn't sound believable. Three years later, at the tender age of 37, he discovered his heart was enlarged. He had to go for an operation for a lung and, and a heart transplant. And he went into the hospital. We had emigrated to Australia from South Africa. And we got a phone call. In fact, it wasn't a phone call. It was an email from his wife saying to us, my husband Trevor has died. The heart-lung transplant went well, but they couldn't stop the bleeding. And as we sat there in tears thinking about that conversation we had had and subsequent conversations because we kept up the friendship and we saw them a few times in their home in Johannesburg, my heart was broken because God had given this man an opportunity to repent an opportunity to believe in the gospel, an opportunity to turn his eyes towards Christ. Jesus knew that three years later, he would die. And here was God reaching out in grace and saying, Trevor, it doesn't have to end in disaster. I'm offering you an olive branch. I'm offering you life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. One of the commentators put it like this. Peter is left to marvel over the events and the reminder of Jesus' word. It is a moment for reflection, decision and faith. Is resurrection the only adequate explanation for what Peter sees? Is not resurrection what Jesus promised? Has not God acted on behalf of Jesus? Is Jesus alive to carry out God's plan after all? These are the questions not only for Peter in the moment of his discovery, but for all who relive that moment through Luke's retelling of the story. What is your stumbling block? Is your stumbling block you want more evidence? Go to the scriptures. It's all there. Is it that you look at Christians and say, well, look at all the hypocrites we see of Christians. They, they claim certain things, but look at their lives. Don't look at Christians. Don't let that be a stumbling block. Look at Christ. It's not about whether Christians get it right or wrong. It's about the fact that Jesus got it right all the time. Is your stumbling block your wealth or your possessions relying and trusting in that? What happens when you die? You take nothing with you. The only thing that will matter at that moment is whether or not you know Jesus. Is your stumbling block worldly pleasures? Oh, I'm enjoying all these worldly pleasures, pleasures so much. There's some I don't want to give up. Let me ask you a question. What happens when you're gone? When all those worldly pleasures no longer are available to you? 
and you transport it into the eternal realm, is it worth holding on to those and sacrificing eternity? Do you really want to put all your eggs in one basket and risk everything? Is the stumbling block your pride now that you've lived for so many years having to admit that, yes, I've lived in a way that is in vain? Are you allowing your pride to prevent you from responding to Jesus reaching down to you, grace and mercy? Will you humble yourself Will you bring yourself to the foot of the cross and lay your baggage at the feet of Jesus? Is there some sin preventing you? Do you think your sin is too big, too great? There is no sin too great for God to forgive. Bring it to Christ. He is able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if you are a Christian, this morning. Rejoice, O Christian, rejoice. He lives. And because He lives, you will live in spite of dying in this world. Amen. Our Father, we thank you so much for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is our hope. It is our confidence. May we rest in him. May we find security in him. May we find hope in him. May we look to him in times of difficulty so that we don't pin all our hopes in this world. Help us to turn our eyes to beyond this world, to know that nothing can touch us in terms of our eternal life that is secured through Christ. And I pray, O oh God, Maybe if there's just one who's watching this, who does not know you, who has never turned to you, who doesn't possess resurrection life, oh God, bring them to their knees. Show them their rebellion. Reveal to them the state of their heart. And bring them to the foot of the cross. And there, help them to take that burden and hand it over to you. And find forgiveness and life in Christ. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.